Most of us live on the outskirts of history. We look on as the great events of our time pass before us. But James Thomas Kraft was called onto history's stage, an actor fated to play a part in the Second World War. That war, in fact, was the sequel to another, already two years in the making when Jim Kraft entered this world, the Great War of 1914. He was born in the quiet town of Princeton, West Virginia, on May 18, 1916. By then, the war's longest battle, the nine-month Battle of Verdun, was in its third month. Soon another of the war's bloodiest conflicts would begin, the Battle of the Somme, which caused more than a million casualties. World War I was advertised as the war to end all wars, but it was not. In fact, it picked up again in 1939, and for the same reason as every war, because bad deeds multiply. Bad deeds can cast long shadows, but so can good ones. And in 1944, Jim Kraft's good deed was to step forward for his family, his wife Hope, his son Irv, his daughters yet unborn, for his neighbors, and for the little A&P grocery store where he worked in Harmon, Virginia. That was March of 1944. By the end of July, he was in New Orleans aboard the USS LSD-582, preparing for operations in the South Pacific. The LS in LSD was short for landing ship, and the T was short for tank. They answered a specific challenge, how to get large vehicles, tanks especially, and other large quantities of fuel, ammunition, and soldiers from ship to shore. The solution was a large flat bottom ship that could be driven onto a beach and its cargo unloaded through double doors at its bow. This was quite a novelty, something that would have earned any captain a court martial in the 18th century. The rule then was clear. He who doth suffer his ships to founder on rocks and shoals shall be punished. But that was precisely what the LSTs were designed to do. As the ship's bow was driven up onto the beach, a stern anchor was let out behind that could be used later as a winch to tow the vessel back into the sea. A single 328-foot Atlas T could bring to shore 2,100 tons of men and supplies. Problem was, with their flat bottoms, they were three times slower than the average battleship and hard to maneuver and they were armed only with one 40mm and six 20mm anti-aircraft guns. For sailors, LST stood for Large Slow Target. On August 8th, the LST-582 was steaming from New Orleans to Panama City, Florida. Not en route to the South Pacific, this was to practice the crucial maneuvers the crew would have to master before they entered those battle zones. As was said in the days of sailing ships, the crew were learning the ropes. The drilling was constant, anchoring the ship, learning to move in columns with other ships, target practice for the gunners, making smoke for camouflage, and most important, beaching the LST, and then pulling back out to sea. As quartermaster, Jim Kraft worked alongside the navigator, keeping the ship on course from watch to watch, keeping its nautical charts, instruments, and clocks in good order, and training lookouts and helmsmen. On September 4th, he was on his way to war. Now with ammunition and 100,000 gallons of fuel aboard, the LST-582 steamed through the Panama Canal, and from there, after brief stops in San Diego and Pearl Harbor, to load vehicles and more fuel, to the Russell Islands in convoy with four other LSTs. Averaging only 10 miles per hour, that took four weeks. Liberated from the Japanese in the Battle of Guadalcanal the previous year, the Russell Island chain of the Solomon Islands was now a staging area. Onto Jim Kraft's LST went more supplies, and now several Marines headed into combat at its next destination, New Guinea. On November 8th, the LST-582 set out for New Guinea in convoy with nine other amphibious landers and two minesweepers. 
On December 20th, when they finally drove the ship onto the beaches of Sansapor on New Guinea's northwest coast, the LST fleet had grown to 37. There were no roads from the coast into the jungle, only footpaths, and so at one of these dockings, Quartermaster Kraft was recruited to help the Marines carry supplies inland toward the battle lines. New Guinea is the second largest island in the world, bigger than Texas and Oklahoma combined, and it's entirely covered by jungle. The battle for this island, now in its third year, would cost 216,000 lives before its end. On top of the general misery of these jungles, the rain, the mud, the mosquitoes, wet clothes, sand that would cut into soldiers' feet, snipers were present as well as the threat of typhoid and malaria. The crew of the LST-582 was there for six weeks, ferrying equipment and men from outlying islands onto various beaches along its northern coast. On December 30th, at 1600 hours, Jim Craft's LST was underway for the Philippines. By January 4th, they had joined Task Force 78, an armada of 420 ships moving north through the Soriago Strait. General MacArthur was there in the convoy aboard the USS Boise. This was to be the second major assault of the Philippine campaign a beach landing in Linge and Gulf on the coast of Luzon. That same day, January 4th, an American ship was badly damaged by a kamikaze and had to be scuttled. Then it was midget submarines. One of the subs was rammed by an American ship, but not before its two torpedoes had just missed MacArthur's ship. Jim Craft's LST was torpedoed too, but that too was a miss. More suicide planes flew in as they sailed past Manila, more than 50, and seven ships were severely damaged. The LST 582's gunner brought one down. The LST 912 wasn't as lucky. At 5.59 on the 8th, a Japanese valve plowed into it, killing four men. Vice Admiral Jesse Oldendorf's battleship entered the Gulf ahead of the amphibious landers with the 79th Fleet. Under heavy kamikaze attacks, they cleared out Japanese batteries, underwater mines, and other obstacles. Two senior officers and a Time Magazine reporter were killed on the bridge of Oldendorf's ship, the New Mexico, and the Admiral himself was slightly wounded. But they did their job. And when Jim's ship hit the beach on D-Day, January 9th, under the cover of heavy naval bombardment, resistance was light. The LST-582 was the third ship to land and unload its cargo of troops and LVTs, amphibious vehicles that could also move on land. Thanks to the previous artillery bombardments, the troops went in standing up. Instead of meeting bullets when they reached the beach at 9.30, they were greeted by hundreds of Filipino citizens, waving white flags, bedsheets, and old shirts on bamboo poles. On February 7th, the LST-582 was on its way back to the Solomon Islands, now to prepare for the assault on Okinawa. They loaded four 3x12 pontoon bridges, 20mm ammunition, 40mm bullets, and 5-inch projectiles and powders, LTVs, marine gear, 476 marines, and 86,000 gallons of water. After much drilling at Guadalcanal, they set out for Okinawa. By March 31st, Okinawa was visible off the LST's starboard beam. The next morning, at 0400 hours, the LST-582 was moving into Hagushi Harbor along with 1,300 other ships. At 406, Admiral Kelly Turner radioed his orders from aboard the flagship, the USS El Dorado. Land the landing force. And 45 minutes later, 10 battleships began blasting the island with their 16 and 14 inch guns. The USS Colorado, the Idaho, the New Mexico, the Nevada, the Texas, the New York, the Arkansas, the Tennessee, 
and the West Virginia. Commander Henry Thomas changed course six times as he moved in toward the beach, a standard zigzag maneuver designed to throw off enemy radar. And at 0700, the LST's bow was firmly up on the beach. Fortunately for these amphibious landers, there was little enemy resistance. The commander of the Japanese defenses of Okinawa, General Mitsuri Yushijima, had decided in the weeks leading up to the attack that he did not have the resources to defend the island's beaches or the airfield behind them. His soldiers had instead built deep underground fortifications in the island's hilly interior. It was only when the American troops penetrated inland a few days later that the combat became vicious. The landing of LST-582 went smoothly. The troops and the LTVs were unloaded in about 30 minutes. Then they worked to unload the pontoon bridges. But in the afternoon, a tragedy. One of the Marines on board shot himself in the chest. He was taken to LST-949 for treatment, but died on the way. Jim's crew spent two weeks at Okinawa. Often they were out at sea loading supplies from the Liberty ship stationed in the nearby island of Kermaretto, and then ferrying them back to the Okinawa beaches. On April 4th, they were loading 5-inch shells onto the destroyer Laffey, a ship that went on to survive six kamikaze attacks 12 days later. <laughs> Quartermaster Kraft could not have known at this time, but he was playing a part in the last major naval battle in history, and the last battle of the Second World War. When the LST-582 steamed back to the Philippines later in April, it was to make preparations for an invasion of the Japanese mainland that never occurred. Jim Craft returned from the doorway of danger to the doorway of home, to scenes overflowing with joy. He was united again with Hope, Irv, his sister Nellie. He'd written Nellie just before his LST shipped out to Okinawa. I sure will appreciate all the little things of life, which I took for granted before, such as Coca-Cola, ice cream, fresh vegetables, newspapers, We're glad he came home to those simple comforts, to some share of the peace purchased by his sacrifice. To you, Quartermaster Craft, we owe thanks, and to all whose good deeds cast shadows of light. <laughs>